Ted, good morning. Thanks for taking the time to join us, and thanks for coming on video. We appreciate that. Good to see you. Yep. Hello, Ted. Uh, first, been too long, Ted. You came in studio with us. We were in Fairfax when I still had day one. Hair. Yeah, we were. I tell people you were like the first podcasters, right? Back on AOL Sports that had to be mid nineties. Late yeah, 90s, late 90s, late, late we 90s, did. Yeah. yeah, I've got some blogs out there that I'm probably not that proud of at this point <laughs> <laughs> on AOL Sports. Yeah, well, you were relevant then, still relevant. It's great. Thanks, by the way, for all the work you're doing with us uh, on the network. I think it's been really, really great. Fans love you. Of course, we're happy to do that. So, uh, first, congrats on getting the deal done with uh, Washington, D.C. and Mayor Bowser. You guys are going to be in the district now for... Uh, up to 2050 to extend the rest of my life. life for the rest of your yes. life. So that's, that's great news. Uh, but before that, uh, the dalliance with Virginia, were you surprised at the political and public backlash regarding the potential move of the caps and wizards out of DC to the Alexandria site? Yeah, I, I think, think I'm a businessman business man and, um, and then we own sports teams, teams and we got caught into something beyond us that had nothing to do with business or sports. And so when the mayor really did a great job in sting, sticking with it and basically saying, you should stay here and let's work as a partnership. And, you know, I'm only looking forward now. I, I, I really look at the four months that we were working in Virginia as a learning lesson certainly for us I, I hope everything works out great for the people in alexandria and potomac yards and virginia but now we're looking at what do we do in downtown dc and we're starting to get very very excited about the potential of how we can create a expanded entertainment center downtown um, use um, capital one arena as kind of the anchor for that community we can expand up outside, you know, around the building, work in partnership with some of the local um, real estate companies and, and restaurants and, you know, just try to restart downtown D.C., which is one of the main uh, drivers for the mayor and the city council and their agenda. We need to have a thriving downtown. We need to have people moving back into the community. We need people eating, dining, shopping downtown. And not only is that good for the whole city, it generates revenue. We generate tax um, dollars for the city, which it then can use for the rest of the city's benefit. So, you know, this was a very straightforward relationship and, you know, we're moving forward together. So it, it's early in the in the process, obviously, but when do you think you'll start seeing the, those updates and expansions to Capital One? And are, are there any certain must-haves for you and your group when it comes to amenities and upgrades to fan experiences when they come to events at Capital One Arena going forward? Well, we have a, a plan that's being developed, and you know, it, it was also the plan in Virginia where we had to say fans – and employees and players in the community at large. And then how do you take your available dollars and the land that's available and apply that in balance? And so we have a lot of work to do immediately for the players here at Capital One Arena. If you've been downstairs, you know how tight it is. And it's, you know, like any home that's 25, 30 years old, you outgrow it. And so we need locker rooms, better training facilities downstairs. We need to accommodate the visiting teams in a much better way. It's kind of embarrassing that just trying to get into the loading dock, um, you can't drive down, you can't make U-turns. There's you know, water all over the place in terms of bottled water and soda <laughs> and beer. So we just need space. And what was really fortuitous for us was that the mall next door, it went bankrupt. Mm. It also went bankrupt while we were moving in and building the world's most advanced esports center. And, you know, that was very um, 
shattering to us. It's like, oh, geez, we weren't expecting to not have electricity. You know, how are we going to get connectivity here? But the city and a great real estate partner um, bought that, bought the um, building and is working with us. And we can take some space there, move a lot of the stuff that's kind of back of the house and open up so that we can build more space for the players uh, and their their families downstairs and also the media you know we were rated the worst media center uh in the league mm. right so that just happens o- over time it's because the buildings get older and you know you, we while we were making hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of investments it's hard to take that infrastructure and expand it so you know we have that opportunity for fans you know, you just look at the data over the last 25 years and people want to be closer to the action. They want to have better sight line. Um, I mean, that's just a fact. You look upstairs at just about every NBA arena and people want to be closer. They don't want to sit way, way upstairs. So we have to find ways to reconfigure the seating. That's going to be hard. We'd like to be able to open up some of the the hallways and the, the ways for people to get in and out of the building. Um, we, we measure, you know, by the second, how long it takes people to get into the building. We have to have uh, easier ways to get in and out of the building. Safety and security is very, very important to us. Mm-hmm. Being able to build new infrastructure for higher speed technology. And, you know, one of the challenges we're all facing is uh, our business is very, very um, reliant on having lots of teams and basketball tournaments, but we need to have concerts and shows. And the shows are now, you know, instead of two trucks, they're five trucks. They have lots and lots of video equipment that they're bringing, and and we need to find ways to be able to accommodate those acts. Um, they're very, very demanding. And we're having really, really great success with booking these acts, but they want more space. So, you know, we'll work together for the players, for the fans, for our employees, just to make sure that the money that we're spending, and it'll be a sizable investment, the top of what we've also invested. And it's very much like what's happened in Madison Square Garden, which just happened in Philadelphia. I know that Utah is going to have to do similar kinds of work on their building uh, to accommodate both hockey and basketball and events and shows. It's a real challenge uh, to do it in a very small footprint. And so we've expanded the footprint. We have the resources and the willpower, but it's going to take probably four years. And, you know, we have to fly the plane. We have to keep playing the games that we'll be doing it during the summers. Ted, um, obviously, Caitlin Clark was one of the biggest draws in sports, okay? And she'll be in the WNBA next year. Uh, draft, I think, I think is Monday. Mm-hmm. And the Indiana Fever will draft her number one overall. Um, it, and I'm sure you've talked about this and thought about this. So when she is in Indiana plays here, instead of playing in the uh, entertainment sports arena when they play the Mystics, is that a game that could possibly be moved to cap one because – She's going to be a big draw. I mean, I don't know if she'll sell out Cap One, but she was selling out all these other arenas, and 20 million people were watching her play. So is that something you guys have thought about? Well, you know, I hope this doesn't sound like I told you so, but, um, (laughs) you know, we believe in women's sports. Um, I sat next to Herb Simon, who owns the Indiana team yesterday, and we're amongst or maybe the longest-tenured WNBA owners, the most committed. Uh, we also participated in an investment at the WNBA league level. So we own a piece of women's basketball by owning an NBA team. We own a WNBA team, and we made an investment. So obviously we believe, and I've been saying that it's right size for most games at um, ESA, Uh, In our new arrangement, we will manage ESA, and we have to make investments there. We have to expand if we can to get more seats there. 
Uh, I'll remind everyone that when we moved into ESA, uh, we won the WNBA championship because it had this great, great environment. But the growth of women's sports and the growth of women's basketball, it's the growth stock in all of sports. Um, you know, I was with Jimmy Pitaro um, at ESPN. Bob Iger has mentioned this to us that women's sports is incredibly important to all of the media companies. There's more women than men. They make lots of the buying decisions. They're very, very important to bring young women into professional sports and into college sports and high school sports. And when you see something electric happen, um, these these uh, NCAA games, I think, were, were a pivotal moment for the league. I, I don't think it'll be um, just a flash in the pan. And yeah, we, we have in our agreement now that we can play four games um, at that Capital One Arena for the WNBA. And our decision, our call, if you will, because we're managing the ticket sales and the operations at both operations there. And then we can play all of our playoff games should that be needed. And now we're in the process of a rebuild for the Mystics, as we are a process of a huge rebuild at the at the Washington Wizards. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I thought we were also in a little bit of a rebuild, and and it would be hard to make the playoffs for the Caps. And obviously, it still is. We have four more games, but you know, playoffs really, really ignite the passion of the fan base. And so if we can make the playoffs with, with the Mystics, um, we, we would play at Capital One Arena. Talking to Ted Leonsis, became the owner of the Caps way back in 1999, officially took over the Wizards Mystics in 2010. Um, I did kind of want to dive into the Wizards thing because I think you tweeted out uh, a couple weeks ago about the fans and 90% of them renewing their tickets for the Wizards. And I'm wondering... If you thought it was going to be this painful, you made the decision to go the rebuild route and you brought in some great people um, to do it who've done it before in different places like Oklahoma City. But 15 wins, it's tough as a fan sometimes to see loss after loss. Did you think it was going to be this painful? Um, well, we're at 80% renewals, uh, 90 okay. with the Wizards and 90% with the Caps. Gotcha. Yeah, I've done it before. Um, it's a big, big decision to basically say um, we don't want to have 30 to 40 wins a year, which is where we were. And the main issue, obviously, there is you draft in the middle. And if you do that for a long, long time, you're kind of stuck in the middle. And so, you know, I, I did that totally with the Capitals, seems like a lifetime ago, where we traded all of our best players. That was very painful. And we got high draft picks. That's how we got Alex Ovechkin and Nick Backstrom and, and the like. And, and so we rebuilt that team, and we were, I think, one of the top three or four teams for 15 years in the NHL. We won a Stanley Cup and third most playoff appearances. So, I mean, it paid off, but it was really painful to rebuild. And, you know, Chicago did the same thing. Pittsburgh did the same thing. The formula can work, but getting there is really, really painful. I think Pittsburgh had the worst attendance in the league. You look in basketball, obviously, up the road, trust the process they were bad for a long long time um, you know but they got Joel Embiid and he's a generational player and that's great they haven't won a championship yet but but the fans you know they weren't coming to games it was painful now they have the best attendance one of the best attendance in the league so I knew what I was getting into I knew the criticism too that we would get I'll say that our fans though have been happy that the players are playing hard they're they're really really trying even you know yesterday's game or two nights ago's game it's all a blur now against um against minnesota mm -hmm. we didn't have any of our players right <laughs> everyone was was hurt and we had a great first half we're playing really really hard we're hitting lots of threes we're playing 
the right way, you know, but we just don't have enough to get there. So that was a loss. Minnesota's a great team. We were very, very competitive, and the fans liked what they were seeing. And so we have a lot of work still to do. We, we hopefully will get a high pick this year. Uh, there's still the, the weighted ping pong balls. So, you know, we could win it, win the lottery. We could, um, we can drop down one, two, three, four slots and but we'll get a higher pick than we've been getting. And, you know, we want to just incrementally improve. And in basketball, it's a stars league. And we have to hope that we can draft well. And then when we're good enough, we'll have managed the cap and we can bring in the free agent or we can have enough young assets that we can make trades to bring somebody back in. And let's not forget that Oklahoma City's best player wasn't drafted. Sure. Uh, he was came over in a trade with the Clippers and the Clippers flipped a couple of stars and ended up with a great young player uh, that the Clippers had drafted. And so, you know, it's going to be a hard process. We're going to be very transparent in it. And, um, you know, I think the fans understand what we're going through, and but they're enjoying the ride. And you know, we'll see if, if it works. There's no guarantee, by the way. There's, there's teams that rebuild, don't make the players for a long, long time. I hope that's not us. Oh, we know it, Ted. Um, you know, we I had Chris Weber on the show. Ted made the playoffs in a decade. Ted, we had Chris Weber on the show yesterday. And, you know, that's kind of when we started doing – the TV show, which led to the radio show. And back then we were all fans and we thought C Webb, Juwan Howard, Rasheed Wallace, this team's going to be unbelievable. And it didn't quite happen. Yeah. Well, that wasn't my era. So yeah, that was prior to you. Yeah. Then, and, um, <laughs> but I wouldn't have traded Chris Weber. <laughs> <laughs> Smart. Uh, Ted, let's uh, touch on the caps. Uh, seems like the hiring of coach Carberry for the caps has been a home run. He's got the team in the playoff hunt with just four games remaining He's found a way to blend the younger talent in with the veteran core. Chucky Lindgren's been an awesome story as well. The future seems bright for the Caps with Coach Carberry at the helm. Yeah, he's the youngest coach in the league, and I'm really proud of him. He's very, very positive. He's connected with the players. And um, this was an unexpected year, right? That When Nick pulled up and really struggling, that was a uh, – difficult moment for us in the trade deadline we move Kuznetsov and um, and TJ Oshie's been in and out of the lineup a lot it's been a tough a tough go for us yet here we are with four games left you know, we could qualify for the playoffs and trust me everyone wants to make the playoffs mm -hmm. and so you know tonight's a really really important game for us and what it shows me is that our organizational excellence, we shouldn't undersell our Hershey affiliate and the work we've done in Hershey. We still have the best practice facility and training facility in Alston, Virginia. Um, you know, very creative work there, being on the top, the rooftop of a building, and um, I mean, of a parking lot. And we had, you know, the expansion opportunities to do lots of interesting things there for the team. And Hershey's been great. Hershey had one of the best years last year, obviously won the call the trophy. It was very analogous to a lot of our players having won the Calder um, Cup and then coming up to the, to the Caps. And so that organizational line of excellence and our training and the play calling and the way we, we, we rest and you know what the playbook is, when the young kids come into the lineup, they're not focused on anything but, you know, executing and filling in that position next man up. So I give a lot of credit to the whole organization, and, and Spencer's just been a, a joy to behold for us. If we make the playoffs, we should be in consideration for Coach of the Year. Absolutely. Definitely. Well, Ted, we appreciate the time. It's been too long. We'll have to have you on again soon. We, I'll come we, on a lot. Okay, perfect. It's new your, day, new way. Love to be, be on the show. Hey, come you, in studio. We're just a couple blocks from Nats Park. We're, we're not that far away. I, I understand, and uh, we hope to see you in our new studios, too. Certainly. That'd be cool. Definitely. 
All right, Ted Leonsis, thanks so much for the time. We appreciate it. We'll talk Thank to you again you. soon. Yep. All right, bye-bye.